Well, thank you very much for this invitation. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to speak to you on this topic of ovarian cancer and the primary surgical management of patients with advanced disease. In this presentation, what I would like to discuss uh, with all of you is a number of factors regarding how we determine which patients are ideal candidates for surgery versus chemotherapy in the upfront setting at the time of initial diagnosis of advanced ovarian cancer. During the course of this presentation, I would like to speak to you about some of the key studies that have evaluated the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary cell reductive surgery in advanced ovarian cancer, and particularly addressing the main findings from each of these studies. In addition to that, I would like to discuss the assessment of tumor resection. Obviously, this is a key and important point when determining how to manage patients with advanced ovarian cancer. And I'll speak to some of the tools and strategies that we use to determine the management of these patients. I'll speak specifically about the structured radiology report that is used in our department at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Talk a little bit about the role of uh, PET-CT in patients with advanced ovarian cancer, as well as the laparoscopic scoring system or the Fagotti score, and how this is now used routinely in many institutions to determine whether a patient is an ideal candidate for primary cytoreductive surgery, and also speak as to what are some of the potential drawbacks from that approach as well. In addition, I'll speak briefly about the peritoneal carcinomatosis index, or PCI. This is used in many institutions, once again, to uh, determine the extent of disease and whether that patient will be an ideal candidate for surgical cytoreduction. And then just briefly, I will conclude uh, highlighting some of the recent publications pertaining to nomograms to determine a likelihood of complications from primary surgery in the setting of advanced ovarian cancer, and then highlight a recent publication by uh, Christina Fotopoulos and her group with regards to surgical quality indicators in advanced ovarian cancer. So just beginning with some of the key studies, and many of you have already obviously learned of the results of a number of these studies that evaluated upfront surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And I'm not going to specifically go through all of the extensive details of each of those studies, but more so to highlight the fact that at this point, we have had a number of prospective randomized studies evaluating this question, and then put that in perspective with regards to the current patterns of practice in patients with advanced ovarian cancer. The first study was the study by the EORTC uh, led by Ignaz Vergot. And in that study, certainly the findings were that there was no difference in progression-free survival or overall survival when comparing up, upfront debulking surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this was one of the first studies indicating to us that in, in the setting of advanced ovarian cancer, in a prospective randomized study, there was no difference in terms of oncologic outcomes comparing the upfront surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There was subsequently a second study. This was the CORE study that looked at primary chemotherapy versus primary surgery for newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer patients. And certainly there have been some criticisms about the patient population in this study or the adequacy of the surgical side of reduction but nevertheless, also the findings did confirm that there was no difference, again, in disease-free survival or overall survival when comparing primary surgery versus primary chemotherapy. And thus, this was the second study that confirmed uh, these findings. A third study has been uh, published recently. This was from the Japanese Clinical Oncology Group, and again, asking the same question. Does primary debulking surgery offer an advantage to patients when compared to neoadjuvant chemotherapy for stage three or stage four disease? And what they found in that study was once again, no difference in uh, progression-free survival or overall survival when comparing primary surgery to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. One of the things that they also highlight in that study is that certainly when looking at the amount of residual disease, uh, certainly if the patient is able to undergo surgery and that surgery achieves an R0 cytoreduction, 
then those patients tend to draw a benefit with regards to uh, oncologic outcomes. So certainly, again, highlighting uh, many of the, of the findings that we knew from retrospective data that R0 is ideal if the patient is a candidate for surgery. Most recently published in the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer was the SCORPION trial. The SCORPION trial was uh, led by Anna Fagotti. And again, this was a randomized trial of primary debulking surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy for advanced epithelial ovarian cancer. And once again, what the investigators found was that progression-free survival and overall survival was no different when comparing these two strategies in determining how to manage patients with advanced ovarian cancer. So once again, we have four prospective randomized trials um, uh, demonstrating that there is no difference in oncologic outcomes, uh, whether the patient undergoes neoadjuvant chemotherapy or primary cytoreductive surgery. And again, this in this discussion, we don't have the time to go over some of the details and the potential drawbacks and, and criticisms of each of these studies, but then just to prove a point that from prospective randomized data, there is no difference in that setting. Obviously, we await the results of the TRUST trial. Uh, the TRUST trial certainly is also exploring the same question, uh, primary surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, what's unique about this trial certainly is that um, patients are um, randomized, uh, certainly regardless of, of the tumor volume. And I think also the, uh, the, the fact that many of the centers that are involved are known for their aggressive side reduction and certainly the high volume of their centers also provides a, a, a potentially a much higher level of proficiency with regards to the attempt at a primary set of reductive surgery. So therefore, obviously this study has uh, completed accrual and we anticipate the results in um, 2023. So hopefully this will be an additional information with regards to whether patients would benefit from primary surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Interestingly, there was a recent study by Alex Melamed and their group uh, published in JAMA Network. And in this study, they basically looked at a large database in the United States to determine if the patients um, certainly had any detrimental effects from the increase in neoadjuvant chemotherapy trends that we have seen in the United States. As you can see here from this graph, uh, from 2004 to 2016, there has been an increase in the percentage of patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And certainly you see it in also in women treated for advanced stage high-grade serous carcinoma. Um, and this is a, a pattern of practice that I think is also reflective of many other countries where the percentage of patients with advanced ovarian cancer are continuing to have a, a higher likelihood of being uh, recommended neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And presumably the argument is that if you consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy to be inferior to primary cytoreductive surgery, then with an increasing in neoadjuvant chemotherapy, one would potentially then expect a worsening of the survival. But in fact, that's not what we have seen. And in fact, the survival has continued to improve with a rise in the neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting. So that's very important. And what they conclude from that study was that the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy has increased from 17% in 2004 to 45% in 2016. But more importantly, that the uptake of neoadjuvant chemotherapy was not associated with any changes in median overall survival trends. So certainly, when we uh, also look and evaluate uh, this question of neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary surgery, many times the question comes up with regards to, are we comparing the same patient population? And this is a, a study that is about to be published that actually did propensity score matching to match the qualities and risk profiles of the patients. And again, what they, uh, what they found in this particular study was that there was no difference in terms of survival uh, probability when looking at the neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus uh, primary cytoreductive uh, surgery, as you see here on the right side. 
Um, I would just uh, certainly encourage all who are interested in looking at a very uh, comprehensive summary of this question of primary versus interval surgery to look at this particular article, um, which I think certainly highlights some of the main points that I have just discussed and also or gives uh, an overview of the important studies that have been previously published in the randomized fashion. So now getting on to the point of how do we select patients? How do we determine whether a patient should be a candidate for surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy? And obviously one of the things that we look at obviously is the radiology and the, and the imaging studies to determine who is that ideal candidate. One of the things that we recognize is that in many institutions, there's a lot of variability with regards to the reporting of the findings on the CAT scans. And uh, certainly it ranges from a very detailed report to a very uh, superficial report where it's just uh, describing carcinomatosis without really providing the surgeon guidance as to how extensive is that carcinomatosis. So this is an example of the strategies that we use here in our institution. This is basically, we developed a radiology report that is structured so that all of our patients will have a very clear and defined uh, definition of where disease is found. And as you can see here, we ask the radiologist to describe where they see disease and where they don't disease, see that disease. So um, this is an example of the chest where we ask them um, not only the lungs, but also the thoracic nodes, the condition of the pleura, whether there is any pleural effusion, pericardial effusion. And then when, he, when we get into the abdomen and pelvis, we ask them to really be extensive and descriptive with regards to how much disease there is. So as you can see here, we ask uh, on, on details on the parenchyma, the liver, the spleen, pancreas, gallbladder, uh, kidneys, adrenals, abdominal adenopathy, um, uh, above the renal hilum, below the, liver, the renal hilum, um, and certainly we want them to be as comprehensive as possible so that we will have a better um, piece uh, of information, a better tool to determine uh, whether that patient should even be considered for a laparoscopic assessment or whether that patient should just have a biopsy and proceed with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In our institution, we don't use routinely PET-CT um, prior to the evaluation of uh, cytoreduction. Uh, certainly, we don't feel that in the literature there is a great value in, uh, in obtaining uh, PET-CT. Uh, this is a recent uh, study in 2020 that evaluated this question and uh, decided, and the conclusion was that PET-CT is not the most effective imaging examination to estimate the extent of peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, this is a Cochrane review also looking at the same question. And they really suggested that PET-CT has high specificity, but a low to moderate sensitivity. So therefore, we typically do not use it in the upfront setting. The laparoscopic approach. Obviously, Dr. Fagotti in 2005, so more than 15 years ago, um, began her work with regards to using laparoscopy to determine whether a patient is an ideal candidate for surgery. Many of you are very familiar with this system where uh, multiple areas of the abdominal cavity are evaluated. And certainly there is a scoring system that determines that if there is evidence of disease in that particular area, that patient is assigned a score of two. And if there's no evidence of disease, then that patient is assigned a score of zero. And many of you are familiar with those criteria as well and, uh, and use it in your institution. And in our institution, we do use it as well. Um, recently, there was also a publication where uh, they looked at what should be the appropriate score to determine whether a patient will go to surgery or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Initially, a score of eight was used. In other words, less than eight or equal to eight, the patient will go to surgery. More than eight, then the patient will go to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In this particular uh, study, they did a reevaluation once the introduction of upper abdominal surgery was performed, and they considered that the score of 10 or less would be ideal for surgery, and anything above 10 would then be more so a, a score for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This concept of using laparoscopy has been evaluated um, very um, extensively in retrospective manner. 
Uh, this was actually a prospective study that looked at laparoscopy uh, to determine how many cases would be unnecessarily operated if using laparoscopy versus not using laparoscopy. This is a study that was published a few years ago. Um, and this was the randomization. Patients were randomized to either no laparoscopy and straight to primary cytoreductive surgery or laparoscopy to determine what to do with those patients. And what they found was that, that certainly when you're looking at the futile laparotomy, if you did laparoscopy, it was 27% versus 57% if you just went straight to surgery. In other words, the percentage of patients that benefit from laparoscopy by avoiding an, a large laparotomy, certainly, as you see here, is higher when you use laparoscopy. In other words, when you explore with laparoscopy before surgery, certainly you, you're, you're determining which patients are ideal candidates for laparotomy and your rate of R0 will certainly increase by using the laparoscopic evaluation because you're selecting patients where you are gonna have a much higher likelihood of uh, proceeding with an R0 SATA reduction. This is a recent study where they evaluated um, whether the surgeon could just determine based on the radiology report uh, or the radiology images, I should say, whether the patient is an ideal candidate for surgery. And in that study, they found that surgeon radiology review did not correlate highly with actual laparoscopic scoring. So what this means is that some surgeons will say, well, I'll just take a look at the imaging and based on the imaging, I'll just decide myself whether the patient is a candidate for surgery or chemotherapy. And in fact, what it was shown is that laparoscopy still gives you a much better information than the surgeon just looking at a radiology report. And then certainly the peritoneal carcinomatosis index, many of you are familiar with this uh, system. This was um, initially uh, proposed by Paul Sugarbaker. Um, and this is a, it's a, a very complex uh, scoring system. It's uh, 13 regions of the, uh, of the abdomen and pelvis are evaluated. And each of those, uh, each of those regions then uh, look at a lesion uh, size score, as you can see here, um, depending on the amount of disease that is, uh, that is found. This is something that we do not use in our institution at MD Anderson. Um, certainly, there are some criticisms with regards to the utility of the peritoneal carcinomatosis index. Um, there is inconsistency as to what should be the cutoff value with regards to proceeding with surgery or going to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In many of the studies where the peritoneal carcinomatosis index has been used, um, the, the, not all patients have advanced stage disease, so therefore may not be applicable to the patient population that, that we're interested in evaluating. Um, not all patients have undergone an attempt at side of reduction. Um, there's really no data. Probably this is the most important element. There's no data on impact on survival by using the peritoneal carcinomatosis index and definitely no prospective uh, data. Um, certainly there is limited assessment by laparoscopy in trying to perform a peritoneal carcinomatosis index. Um, there's a propensity for error in assessment of tumor size and determining from one surgeon to another as to what is the size of the tumor that is found in each of these regions. And then also variations in the boundaries of the determined regions. As you saw, these were 13 regions and there could be significant variability from one surgeon to the other. <clears throat> There's, a, there's a, a scoring application that will soon come out. This is a scoring application that will be something that will be available for each of your um, phones. Um, and this will be an application where you can actually then determine based on the information that you have uh, in your findings on laparoscopy as to whether the patient will have uh, or will be a candidate for cytoreductive surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this will soon be available. And as you can see here, then there's a determination. You get a score as to um, whether that patient should undergo surgery or not based on that, uh, on that particular application. And certainly I'm happy to provide additional comments as to how to get that application 
um, if, uh, if you contact me for that. And then just lastly, um, you know, obviously one of the things that one is concerned about is when proceeding with primary cytoreductive surgery, ideally one wants to get to the, to the point of R0 cytoreduction, where the patient uh, is able to um, have the best chances of a very good oncologic outcome, but not at the cost of major surgical complications. So this is a study that is about to come out. Um, this is a study led by Ali Sivanovic from, um, from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they provide this um, algorithm or nomogram, I should say, that um, determines the likelihood of a patient having complications uh, from primary cytoreductive surgery and certainly encourage all of you to read this uh, manuscript. And then lastly, uh, the uh, ESGO uh, recently published the quality indicators for advanced ovarian cancer surgery. And I think that this is a, a, a very important uh, uh, manuscript and a very important piece of information for all of us who perform um, cytoreductive surgery in advance of ovarian cancer, and I would encourage all of you to read this as well. And it was published in the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer. Points for consideration, certainly patients with poor profile, generally other patients who undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So certainly that may not be a fair comparison in the retrospective studies. And thus the reason why in the prospective studies there often is no difference. Trials evaluating operable patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy have shown no difference. We talked about four randomized trials that showed no difference. The CT scan, certainly we encourage uh, all of you at your center to develop a radiology uh, structure report so you will get a lot more information from the radiologist. The laparoscopic assessment, although certainly it is of value, it may have some limitations, particularly in the evaluation of the retroperitoneum uh, locations uh, behind the liver, and then also certainly particularly in patients who have multiple adhesions from the tumor burden, uh, this may be limiting. The peritoneal carcinomatosis index is not broadly accepted and, and certainly has had no data on survival advantage. And then certainly we look for the, the report on the TRUST trial for surgeon expertise and quality indicators. In conclusion, there's no difference between surgery and chemotherapy from prospective randomized data. Selective evaluation for primary surgery obviously is important as some patients will benefit from primary cytoreductive surgery, but obviously we need to determine who is the ideal candidate to get to that R0 cytoreduction. The structural radiology report is very much encouraged and laparoscopy as an option for patient selection we consider is ideal. And certainly uh, the, uh, the ovarian cancer scoring app uh, will be out soon. So hopefully uh, that'll be of help to many of you. So once again, thank you so much for um, my invitation and uh, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you.